and we're going to begin reading tonight at verse uh, 35. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's remain standing for prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight once more. We pray that you would open our hearts and our ears to receive the truth of the word of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would undertake tonight for the proclamation and the application of your word to each heart here. And in the invitation, would you bring about the decisions that need to be made, whether for salvation or for surrender or to win souls for thee. We pray, Lord, that you would stir our hearts, give us a burden for the lost that like you have. And we pray, Lord, that we might be used even this week in the last two nights of our meetings as we shift over to more evangelistic messages presentation of the gospel, not to stay home, but to bring others with us who need to know Christ as Savior. And Lord, may we be able to see others who put their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ and be born again. We pray in these days uh, of these short meetings. We ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Now, I'm sure that you've been encouraged in the past to reach out to win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that uh, Pastor Bailey used to be an evangelist himself and has never been, been, been pastoring the church here. You can expect a church that's being pastored by an evangel a man, fellow who was an evangelist to be an evangelistic church. And I believe that's the way Brother Frank is. I've, I've known his heart for that time from when he was starting out in his evangelistic ministry. Praise the Lord for that. He encourages you to reach out to those who are lost. But uh, maybe you have missionaries uh, that come through every so often or a missions conference every year where, again, you're encouraged by those who are out in the fields and reaching others with the gospel of Christ to do the same, to let God use you to reach others with the gospel of Christ. And then evangelistic meetings like this, uh, maybe once a year, when an evangelist comes in and preaches the gospel plainly and clearly and gives you an opportunity to get a free friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, or someone else to come and hear the gospel and to be saved as well. We hear from many other people about reaching to those who are lost, but tonight I'd like us to take just a few minutes to look at what the Lord Jesus Christ himself had to say about the condition of lost men and women and children and boys and girls and youth tonight. I want us to look at the subject of the Savior on souls tonight. The Savior on souls. Would you notice there are four things I want you to see tonight from our passage. First of all, according to this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ said, there's first, there's a great potential. There's a great potential. Notice what Jesus said in verse 17. Then saith the end of his disciples, the harvest truly is what? Plenteous. The Lord Jesus Christ said there's no problem with the harvest. It's not the only place in the scripture where the Bible tells us these words in John chapter 4, verse 35. The Lord Jesus said, Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh the harvest. For I say unto you, lift up your eyes into the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Again, the Lord Jesus Christ said, there is no problem with the harvest. There is no lack of lost souls who need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Souls that are ripe and ready that would come to him if we would simply get to them with the message of the gospel. I got on an airplane once headed for one of our mission trips and it was a little commuter plane. I, I had two seats on one side of the aisle and one seat on the other side of the aisle and I walked on and I, I chose the two seat side of the aisle and put my luggage in the overhead compartment and sat in the aisle seat and wondered if I'd get to put the armrest up and spread out a little bit <clears throat> before uh, the plane took off. But as the uh, plane continued to fill up about 15 minutes before takeoff, a young woman came down the aisle and pointed at the, at the window seat next to me. I got up, helped her put her luggage in the overhead compartment and, and got out of the way. She scooted herself past into the window seat. I took my seat again and we started to talk like you do being seat mates. And she said to me, well, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a preacher. She said, really, what do you preach? Well, she asked for it, amen. So I reached up and got my pocket Bible out and began to share the gospel with her. You know, before we were even in the air 15 minutes, that young woman bowed her head and prayed right out loud, so loud I looked around to see if anybody was listening, and there were some, and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into her heart and to be her Savior. In fact, before we landed in Boston where we were making a connection to the next flight overseas, she was asking me, I'm from Rhode Island. If you're an evangelist, you ever come to Rhode Island? Do you know of any good Bible preaching churches there I can go to where I can learn more about this? I want to know no more because I want to share this with my boyfriend too and I want to tell him how he can be saved. You see, that's extraordinary. No, there are people like that around Goose Creek. There are folks like that in Charleston. There are folks like that in Monk's Corners. People who are ripe and ready to come to Christ so somebody would simply get to them with a message 
of the gospel. Uh, my pastor helped us hook up our rig at home once and pulled too hard on the, cl- uh, on the plug when he was plugging it in and pulled the ground wire off in the plug. Now, I happened to be inside the vehicle, so I noticed something was obviously wrong when the fridge started smoking. I hollered out the window. He unplugged it again. We traced miters down and figured out what it was, put the ground wire back on and hooked it back up again. And now there was a big black burn mark in the back of our fridge. So the very next week meetings we had was in southern New Jersey. And just down the road from the church was an appliance repair facility. So I called up the facility and said, could you send somebody out to look at our fridge? This is what happened with it. So the next morning, a repairman showed up with his work truck and uh, came in with his tools and started checking things over. And, and he said, well, there is a big black burn mark in the back. But it does appear to be operating correctly. You don't want me to fix it, do you? I said, no, I've got a rule. If it's not broken, don't fix it. So he started to put the tools away. And he said, what are you doing living in a rig like this behind a church? I said, oh, I'm an evangelist. I have the joy of traveling around all the time and sharing with folks how they can know for sure if they died, they'd be on their way to heaven. He said, you know, a lot of my friends have been getting involved in religion lately. He said, there's so many religions. I've always wondered how you can tell who's right. I picked up my Bible off the table. I said, you know what this book is? He said, that's a Bible, isn't it? I said, yes, sir. Do you know what the main idea of that book is about? He said, oh, in the religion I grew up in, they never encouraged us to read our Bibles. I said, if I could tell you in 15 minutes or less what the main idea of that book is about, would you let me do it? He said, you can do that book in 15 minutes? I said, yes, sir. He said, go right ahead. So I took him to one verse of scripture, the gospel in a nutshell, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Took the verse apart word by word, had him explain the meanings of the words to me, put it all back together again, explain the meaning of the verse to him and said, you understand what that says? He said, yes, sir. I said, you understand what you need to do today? He said, yes, sir. I said, would you like to bow your head right now and ask the Lord to save you? I'd be happy to pray with you. He said, yes, sir, I would. And he bowed his head right there and asked Christ to come into his heart and to forgive his sins and save his soul. And never forget what he said to me when he was loading his tools back in his work truck before he left. He said, preacher, I don't know why you called me out here today to look at your fridge. There's not a thing wrong with it. But he said, I know why I was supposed to be here today. God wanted to be here so that I'd be saved. Folks, there are people like that, divine appointments that God has set before every last one of us as believers that we can use to share the gospel with folks who are lost. Jesus said, there is no problem with the harvest, with the field. I share with you how so many people have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the Fiji Islands, but you know what? Is, even though we had the opportunity to help start that church in Raki, Raki, it still has no full time pastor yet. Missionaries are taking turns weekend to weekend trying to keep it, uh, keeping it running and God's blessing things there, but they need their own pastor. By the way, do you know what language is spoken in Fiji? English. English. There's a camp up in Nova Scotia, Canada that our family has the opportunity to minister in every few years when we go up there to preach. And there are 12 churches that send their children to that camp. You know, one of the last times I was there, out of those 12 churches that sent their young people to camp, seven had no pastors. Do you know what language is spoken in Nova Scotia, Canada? English. People who want to be taught to win souls, souls in the community ready to be led to Christ and yet nobody to do that work. And I can tell you story after story after story uh, of other places that are looking for folks to come and share the gospel. And, and when, that, when, that, when that, that, that school principal said to me, can you send somebody here every week to share this message with our school faculty and staff and students? I, said, I had to say, sir, I'm sure we can get somebody to come back sometime, but I know we can't do that every week. We don't know the personnel. I'm only here for a month myself. There are places right now in this world, I could take you with me to Malawi, Africa, where we've been many times doing day camps in, in a different village every day, taking the gospel with puppets and taking the gospel in with, with, with the preaching of the word of God and twice a day preaching. And we've seen many people come to Christ. I remember in one of the villages we preached and when the, when the chieftain of, of the village at whose home we were doing the program found out that we wanted to see not only soul saved, but Bible preaching churches established in these villages. He said, please put up church in my village. I've had the opportunity to minister in the lake area of Malawi, Africa. And there are no good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches in that area. There are many people who are lost fishermen who need to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. But although our mission's been operating there for almost 10 years, we still don't have any new personnel to be able to send up to that part of the country. Everyone we have is busy working in other parts of the country. 
And the Lord, Lord is blessing the preaching of the gospel there in the last 10 years. We had the opportunity to see over 250 churches planted in Malawi and in the borders of Mozambique surrounding Malawi. But they need preachers. They need Bible Institute teachers. They need, but hey, folks, listen, there are, there are people all over this world who are looking for someone who will come and take the message of the gospel, bring it to them, and help others where they are. Come to know Christ as personal Savior. I could tell you story after story after story, but it would all point up what Jesus said in this passage of Scripture. There is a great potential. The harvest truly is plenteous. There's no lack of lost souls that are ripe and ready to come to Christ. Then notice secondly, Jesus said there's a great problem. There's a great problem. He said the harvest truly is plenteous, but, but what? But the laborers are few. The Lord Jesus said the problem isn't, fellas, with the harvest. The problem's with the workforce. Even though there are souls that are ripe and ready to come to Christ to be able to reach them with the gospel, there, there's a lack of, of workforce. There's a lack of volunteers. There's a lack of people that are taking advantage day by day of the divine appointments that God has placed in their way. Every one of us needs to recognize that God has given us divine appointments. There are souls that will never come to Christ unless you reach them because you may be the only believer they will ever know. And yet we live in a day today when, as we said, there are these places that have no church. You know, there was another pastor uh, from New York State that stopped by Elmira, New York, where my father-in-law pastored uh, of the last of the churches that he did before he retired at age 80, 83, uh, who was stopped in to visit. This man was uh, of a group of Baptist churches uh, that were through upper state New York and across that area of the country. And you know, I, I listened to them discussing it. But he talked about the fact to my father-in-law that in just that group of churches, there were 53 churches with no pastors. That's in the United States, here in this country. People who were lacking a pastor. People were lacking one to teach them how to reach out to those who are lost and need to know Christ as their personal Savior. Oh, listen, you don't, even have, to, you don't have to leave the shores of the United States to find people who don't know who Jesus is or why he came. I was preaching out in California and I had finished a week of meetings in a church and the pastor said to me, Brother Webb, I noticed you've got a week free in about a month. I said, yes, sir. We left it open if it didn't get scheduled for a meeting just to rest here for, uh, and look around at some things, do some sightseeing. But he said, well, would you be willing to take just a few of those days to come back here and do a little bit different kind of meetings? I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, we have three different communities around our local church in which we have Bible studies. And he said, and they're in members' homes. He said, there are a lot of folks who won't come to the church building. It, no matter how many times you invite them, they won't come there. But we get them to come to the Bible study, and we win them to the Lord Jesus Christ there at the Bible study. That study, then we can funnel them into the church. And he said, "Would you be willing to come back and do just a one night service at each one of those homes?" And we'll in, for, encourage those people and the other believers in that area to do everything they can to get lost friends and neighbors and coworkers to come so they can hear the gospel and maybe see some of those folks saved. And I said, Pastor, that sounds just like in the book of Acts where Cornelius uh, gathered all of his friends and family and coworkers together and then sent and got Peter to come and preach the gospel. And so many people of the Gentiles came to know Christ as personal savers. As a result, I said, I'd be happy to. And God blessed all three of those services. But I'll never forget the one we had at a Filipino family's home. When we arrived at their house that night, there were over 64 friends, neighbors, and relatives waiting. 64. That's more visitors than we'd had with a whole church working to get visitors to the revival meetings a month before. 64. And, and they fed everybody a delicious Filipino meal. And when the meal was over, they took the tables down and put the food away. And they rearranged the chairs and they introduced their pastor who then turned around and introduced us and explained the reason why that the host had brought all of us to that same place that night was not just to have dinner, but was so we could share with their friends and neighbors and loved ones that what was most important to them and it changed their lives and they hoped would do the same for them. And I we did some ventriloquism with my dummy and then my wife took the younger kids off to another room and taught them. And I had the privilege of preaching the gospel that night eight adults trusted Christ as personal Savior. Two of them, a husband and wife, came to me after the service had dismissed and most of the folks were gone. They said, Preacher, we have been religious all of our lives. We have been in church all of our lives. But this was the first time anyone ever told us that salvation was free. Hey, there are lots of religious people around Monk's Corners and Charleston and wherever it is you live. Some of them are in churches day in and day out, maybe even more than you are. But they don't know that salvation is free. They would come to Christ as someone would tell them, there's no problem with the harvest. The problem is with the laborers. The laborers are few. 
The labors are few. Remember Sunday morning when we preached on Isaiah chapter 6. What did God say? What was the question he was asking Isaiah? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? There's a shortage of personnel, believers to take the message of the gospel to those that God has around you to be able to win to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was preaching in a church just south of where I grew up in Philadelphia. And uh, three times during the week of meetings, it was not a, lar it was not a large church. It's mostly older folks in that church, uh, maybe 50 people that were there. They, dur during the week uh, of meetings, three times older couples asked me if I would come with them. And they led me across the hallway uh, from the church auditorium over into the fellowship hall. And there they wanted to show me their church missionary board. Now, your church has missionary boards in the back with their letters and their photographs and all the rest of that there where you can read the newsletters and you can see the missionaries' photos and, and get an idea of what they're doing. Uh, they wanted to take me over there to show me because in this small church of 50 people, they supported 50 missionaries overseas. And I thought, well, that's a tremendous thing. And that was a tremendous thing. But you know what really, well, the reason they really wanted me to know that was because every single one of those 50 missionaries their church supported were out of their church. Their church. They weren't imports from somebody else's church that got called to missions and came and raised support from their church and went off someplace. I'm talking about people who had been born in that church, raised in that church, went through the youth department of that church, maybe went off to Bible college and got married to somebody there and surrendered to missions and were sent out by their local church or they came back home again and found somebody in the church and married them and they got called to missions and went off. 50 missionaries, every one of them out of that church. Let me ask you, how many missionaries have gone out of Tri-City Baptist Church in most corners? When's the last time some young person here in this church has said, I'll go? When's the last time somebody born here in this, this church said, I, I, I believe God's speaking to me about, about preaching the gospel somewhere else, going and being used in ministry, maybe getting some Bible training or whatever else that way. Listen, folks, there's no problem with the harvest. The harvest is truly plenteous. The problem is the labors are few. And, you know, even as impressed as I was by what those people told me and what they showed me of their missionaries, there was still a problem. You know what it was? There was not a missionary on that board under the age of 50. And I said to those folks, listen, I know you're excited and you ought to be excited about the missionaries your church has sent on in the past, but don't tell me about what your church has done in the past. What is it doing now? Who's the next one to go from this church to fill the need? Jesus said there's a great potential. The harvest is truly plenteous. There's a great problem. The labors are few. Number three, then he said there's a great prayer. There's a great prayer Pray ye therefore, verse 38. And you heard me say last night, when you see therefore in the Bible, look and see what is therefore. Why is this here? Because the harvests are truly plenty, as Jesus said. Because the laborers are few. He said, there is a great prayer that I want you to pray. What is it? Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. May I ask you a question tonight to begin with? Do you faithfully pray for the missionaries your church already supports? Do you? Do you know their names? Do you know what their ministry is about? What country they're on? Do they have a, 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 do they have a church? Do they have a camp? Do they have an orphanage? Do they have something else? What is their ministry all about? You know, it used to be years ago to keep up with and pray for a missionary. In fact, it was pretty difficult because it took months for a letter to come from the mission field by boat. Then we got air, air travel, and it was a little bit more information that we got. But we have no excuse today not to be able to be praying for missionaries in real time because we've got WhatsApp, and we've got Snapchat, and we've got uh, Skype, and we've got all kinds of other things, Magic Jack, phone lines, and everything else, where you can be talking to the missionary right in real time about their needs and praying for their specific needs. And I would ask you tonight, are you praying already for the missionaries your church already supports? I was in a church in eastern North Carolina that I've been to a number of times before. And the last time I was there, there was a young man who would come and pray before the service every night along with the men. He was a little mentally challenged, not severely, but you could tell there was an issue. So, you know, that young man, every night when he prayed, prayed through the names of every single missionary that church supports. By name, what field they were on. I'm asking you, 
adults, I'm asking, never mind the kids, could you do that with your church missionaries? Do you pray faithfully for the missionaries your church already supports? But the Bible says we not only be praying for those folks, but the Lord said, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. In other words, we need to be praying, Lord, send more. Would you fill those places with more? Would you thrust out others into the fields? Would you send more to do that work that's taking place? We already know there are parts of this world and places even in this country are crying out for and asking for folks to come and don't have the personnel to do that. The question is, are we praying, Lord, would you send others? And have you ever bothered to pray, Lord, if you would call me, I'll go. See, I'm convinced that one of the reasons why the average Bible-believing independent Baptist church Christian does not pray the prayer, Lord, send forth more laborers into the harvest is simply because they're afraid that if they pray that prayer, God might call them. May I submit to you, if that's what's going on in your mind, that, that if you are re rebelling against God's plan for your life, how can you expect God to bless anything else about you? If you're disobedient to him, if you're living in rebellion to him, how can you expect him to bless your business now, your house and your family and your car and your health and all the rest of that if you're living in disobedience to the Lord? You are the one person standing in the way of God's great hand of blessing and use of your life to do what God put us all in the world to do in the first place, and that's to reach others with the message of the gospel. Look, I don't believe God calls everybody to be a pastor or an evangelist or a Christian school teacher or, or, or a, a youth pastor, but God does call every believer to be a missionary. There are souls that only you and I can reach. And we are responsible for those that God brings across our path, particularly the divine appointment. I'm not even talking about forcing anything. I'm talking about the fact that there are divine appointments that God has set before us. You cannot fail if you listen to the Spirit of God. Oh, you say, wait a minute. I talked to somebody once about the gospel and they blew it off. They didn't listen to it or they, they turned me off and I failed. Did you? Did you forget what the Word of God tells us? Some plant... Others, water, but what? God giveth the increase. Anybody here know a farmer that expects to harvest their field the very same day they plant their seed? I don't. Anybody here know a farmer that expects to harvest their field two weeks after they planted their seed when they were back out there throwing some fertilizer or some water in the field or whatever else? No, of course not. Any farmer knows that, 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 that he, even if he plants his own field, may not live to see the day of harvest. Somebody else might end up harvesting his field. Doesn't keep the farmer from going out there and planting seed in his field. And you and I have no idea what part of that ministry we have when God gives us a divine appointment. You may be talking to somebody who hears the gospel for the very first time. Please do not get bent out of shape if somebody who's never heard the gospel before and when you share it to them doesn't get saved the first time they hear it. Seed's just been planted, friend. Thank God for the opportunity God gave you to plant the seed. Without that, there's no harvest. It may be that when you talk to somebody, you'll hear them say something like this. You know, I used to work with somebody else who told me the same thing, and I had some questions back then. Maybe you can answer now, or your watering seed somebody else planted before. I don't know how many times I've seen it happen. I didn't do the original planting, but I could tell I was sharing the gospel by pouring water on other seed that somebody else had planted. And then sometimes, praise the Lord, God gives us the opportunity to be able to bring that soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. But even when we have the chance to do that, we have no right to reach around and pat ourselves on the back because you don't know who it was that planted that, that seed in that heart the first time and how many other people along the line have watered it. But the joy of the matter is realizing that every one of us, if we listen to the Holy Spirit of God, what do you mean? I'm not talking about pushing something. I'm talking about listening, going about your daily activities. How many times have you seen, for example, maybe there's been a death in somebody's family and the subject of death. And what happens after death comes up and you're in the middle of that conversation and all of a sudden in your heart, the Spirit of God says, now, 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 what do we do? No, no, no. Not now. Not with these people. God opened the door. 
Or maybe you were, were, were talking with somebody else and, uh, about the church that you go to or they brought up the church they went to or something else. And the, so the subject of church attendance and that kind of thing and what churches believe came up. And again, the Holy Spirit of God said, now, perfect opportunity. Now is the time. Say something. And we said, no. Listen to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> My wife and I were coming back from visiting our two daughters most years we've had the opportunity we get done with our meetings for the year we go back to our home base in western maryland have our board meeting of our ministry and then uh, take the next two weeks to go spend a week each with one of our daughters uh with both of our daughters before coming back to visit with our grand uh, with my in-laws uh for christmas and, and new year's but uh, we were we had been out to visit both of our daughters and one in phoenix first and then we'd driven to san diego where our other daughter was at the time and we flying back to baltimore where our tr truck was parked at a hotel where we'd done the park fly ride deal uh, thing and so we we're flying via from, from San Diego through Philadelphia to Baltimore, and uh, it was I think the 14th or 16th of December. There was supposed to be my pastor told me a terrible ice storm that was going to be coming from west to east and starting back in our home base area about four o'clock in the morning. So we needed to get back there on Friday and get back home. It was two and a half hours to any airport from where we lived, particularly Baltimore as well. Uh, needed to get back there that night. And besides that, we had to work on special music, and I had to be preaching in the church for Sunday. We were going to be ministering in our own home church, and so when we left San Diego late and when we got to Philadelphia we wondered if we were going to catch the flight but we, we, we hurried to the gate and somebody gave us a ride on one of those little beepy carts and when we got to the to the uh, to the gate we didn't have to hurry so much because the co-pilot wasn't there yet so the flight was delayed and, and we sat and we waited as it was delayed again about five more times that night and then finally at 1130 they canceled the flight altogether. No other flights for any airline or that airline from there to Baltimore that evening and the best they could possibly do they said was get us on another flight about three o'clock in the afternoon the next day completely unacceptable. And I said to my wife, honey, listen, there's one other option we can do. She said, what's that? I said, I was raised in Philadelphia here. Look, I, I, I can go to Baltimore Airport. I can drive it anytime. Why don't we just get our luggage back from the airline and we'll rent a car and we'll drive to Baltimore tonight so we can go down and get the truck and get on our way. Well, uh, we agreed about doing that. So we went down to where we were waiting for the luggage to come back. And there were some other people getting their luggage from that flight going because they had vouchers to go spend the night in a hotel and come back for another flight the next day. But there was a lady doctor who was walking back and forth, talking to people around about whether anybody else was going to Baltimore, talking to some of these car companies that had cars to give people rides and, and saying she needed to get back there because she had an important appointment the next morning that she had to be in and all the rest of that and, 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 and the only ones who were willing to give her a ride were some of these charlatan people who wanted to charge her six times what it cost to be able to get there from, from there to there and after watching her for a few minutes I went over and I said ma'am I'm an evangelist not a terrorist I said, my wife and I need to get to Baltimore tonight, and I understand you need to get to Baltimore as well. I just wanted you to know we're going to rent a car, and we're going to drive it tonight. I'm from Philadelphia here. I've been to Baltimore many times. I've been to the airport lots of times. I'd be glad to. Look, if you'd like to ride along with us, we'd be glad to take you. If you want to help pay for the rental car, you can. I'm going to try to get that money out of the airline later on anyway. But look, even if you don't pay anything, I'm just telling you, we're going to have an empty back seat going from Philly to Baltimore, and it's going to be empty unless you decide you want to fill it. It's up to you. She went over and sat down and talked to Cheryl for a few minutes, I guess, to make sure that we weren't terrorists or something. And after a few minutes, she came over and said, all right, I'll take you up on your offer. So our luggage finally got, all got back there, and we, we got a, a shuttle out to the, to the uh, car rental facility at the end of the airport property there. And we went in and rented the car and got our luggage and went out and loaded it in the car. And honest, my wife will tell you, we were not even out of the rental car parking lot before that lady doctor leaned over in the front seat between the two of us and said, so what is an evangelist? And the Holy Spirit said, no! The entire two hours from Philadelphia to Baltimore, that doctor hung over that seat asking us question after question about salvation. Explain that again. I've heard about this, but not. I need more. Tell me more about that. All the way there, we had the privilege of being able to share the gospel with that lady as she asked with a heart that was searching. We dropped her off at her car in the airport parking lot in Baltimore. My wife and I started to pull out of the parking lot. My wife looked over at me and said, well, I guess we know why that flight got canceled tonight. Let me tell you something. There are no mistakes in God's plan. God has divine appointments, souls that are right there. And if you'll just do what the Holy Spirit of God told you to do, you cannot fail. Now, not our responsibility to save anybody. Amen. That's God's responsibility. It's our responsibility to listen to the Holy Spirit and plant the seed or water the seed 
or we get the joy of being able to harvest that seed sometimes. But the Bible tells us we need to be willing to pray and say, Lord, will you use me? Help me to be sensitive to the open opportunities, to the divine appointments that you have set before me. So the Lord Jesus Christ said, first of all, there's a great potential. The harvest is truly plenteous. Number two, there's a great problem. The problem is the laborers are few, but there's a great prayer. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And then as we look at what the word of God says, well, it's easy for him to say, but how are we going to get that done? The Lord doesn't give us commands without giving us instructions. In fact, if you look at the two verses before what Jesus said, you'll find that there's a great example. There's a great example. There's not only a great potential, there's a great problem, a great prayer, there's a great pattern, if you will. A great pattern. Jesus showed every one of us exactly what we all need, whether you're a boy or a girl, teenager or man or woman, what we need to be able to reach souls with the gospel of Christ. What do we need? Notice, first of all, the Bible says in verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Would you notice, first of all, Jesus said to be successful in winning souls, we need to have a boldness to go. A boldness to go. It doesn't say that Jesus sat by the seaside or under the trees and waited for people to come to him. It says he went to them. He went to their villages. He went to their synagogues. He went to their homes to take the message of the gospel. And that's what every one of us needs to do. We need to go forth. Have a boldness. You say, I'm not that kind of a person. Hey, neither am I. Look, if you told me 50 years ago I'd be standing in front of people preaching like this, I would have told you you are outside your head. Because I'm a very shy person. Now, you may not believe that when I'm preaching, but that's because God empowers where he calls. I am the last person to walk up to a total stranger on the street and say, hi, I'm Barry Webb. Can I talk to you about the Lord Jesus? You say, do you do that, Brother Webb? Yes, but I have to ask the Spirit of God to do it because that isn't my personality. My father was the outgoing person in our home. I grew up under that shadow. Do you know something? I thank God for the fact that when he puts us out there, if we have a boldness to go with a sensitivity to his Holy Spirit, I'll say it again, when we listen to the Holy Spirit and we do what he tells us to do and say what he tells us to say, we can never fail in the plan that God has given for us. Do not think that just because somebody you talked to didn't get saved that you failed. That's not true. We need a boldness. You need to ask God to give you that. Lord, help me to help me to be alert to those around me. Help me to see those divine appointments. Help me to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit so that when you say now, I won't say no. What else did Jesus show us we need? Not only do we have, need a boldness to go, but notice it said, and Jesus went about all the cities, verse 35, and villages, preaching in their synagogues, or teaching in their synagogues, and preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom. We not only need a boldness to go, but we need the Bible to plant in people's hearts. The Lord Jesus did not give people psychology, philosophy, or ideology. He gave them what hungry people need, heavenly manna, the truth of the word, and specifically the gospel. And I'll tell you tonight, I believe one of the major reasons why the average fundamental Bible being independent Baptist church Christian is not an effective witness for Jesus Christ is, let's be honest, many believers, maybe even many here tonight, don't even know enough of the gospel verses to tell someone how to be saved. I mean, young folks, what if somebody from a ball team you play on or a school class that you're in or a band that you're involved with actually came and asked you to show them how to be saved? Could you do it from the word of God? See, it doesn't do us any good to stand to somebody face to face, knee to knee or toe to toe and say, this is what my parents raised me to believe or this is what my pastor tells me to believe. This is what my place of worship teaches me to believe. They can say the same things. There's no authority there. The only authority we have is this book. And we need to get it into our head and down into our hearts so that he can bring it out of our mouths anytime he needs to go there. I can't even remember my own phone number, preacher. How am I supposed to remember all those verses? Look, let, let me tell you something. If God made your mind, made your mouth, and made your heart, don't you think he can intersect any of those things anytime he needs to to draw people to him? We need to work on going through your Bible. If you don't know how to take a Bible and show somebody how to be saved, you can see me this week. If you're a lady, you can see my wife this week or you can see pastor anytime. You can see his wife. You can see some of the other leaders here in the church that know how to do that and they can show you how you can mark your Bible. Are you familiar with the Romans Road? 
That's a series of several verses that you don't even have to look to believe the book of Romans and you can just mark the next chapter and verse you're headed for at the end of each verse. You know the verse to start at and then go from there until you come to the end of it. It's like going down a road with road signs along the way and the verses give you the information you need to be able to explain the gospel to those who are lost. There's another way of taking, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, Romans 6.23 and just taking that one verse, using that verse and the words of that verse to help somebody understand how to be saved. But even if you know the Romans road or Romans 6.23, that's not all you you're going to need. You need to start working on learning some of the other verses. As you're reading through your daily Bible reading, etc., and you come across another verse that has to do with the gospel. I mean, what if somebody says, well, I'm doing the best I can to work my way to heaven. Can you answer that with a verse from the Bible that talks about salvation not being by our works? Somebody said, well, I got baptized. Can you answer that from the word of God? See, some believers are afraid to be a witness because they're afraid the people they talk to are going to know their Bible better than they do. There's a way to settle that, and that's to get into the Word. And when you find another verse in your Bible, as you're reading through it, and the Spirit of God says, here's another good one. Underline it, mark it in your Bible. Put a red cross out in the margin so you can find it if you need to when you're going someplace out the way. That, meditate on what it says, then memorize it so you get into your head, down into your heart. So that it, Listen, you may not be able to remember all kinds of other things, but I don't know how many times in my life that I've walked away from witnessing opportunities having shared verses that I didn't even remember I remembered. And you walked away saying, where did that come from? Well, you've just been blessed by the Holy Spirit of God. You've just been, been used by Him because He was able to pull a verse that you plugged in there somewhere along the way out of your heart and put it into your mouth so that He could bring someone to Himself. What a blessing that is. I mean, there's no doubt the Spirit of God is one working through you when He's bringing verses like that to mind. And you'd be amazed at how somebody will say something and immediately the Holy Spirit will drive, drive, drive your mind to exactly the answer from His Word. It won't be your argument that will get somebody out of bed in the middle of the night and on their knees wanting to accept Christ as Savior, but it will be some well-placed verse of Scripture that the Spirit of God has taken from your heart, plugged into your mind and mouth, and shared with somebody. And that's been used by Him to draw someone to Savior. We need to ask God to give us a boldness if we need that. Or we need to ask God to give us a knowledge of the Bible so we can plant the Bible in people's hearts. But there's one other thing the Bible says Jesus showed us that we need, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You know what Jesus showed us we need? Thirdly, we need a burden. We need a burden for those who are lost. It says, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. You know, it's not your arguing that's going to draw somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not your debate. You know, in, in 39 years of evangelistic ministry, I found out the average lost person doesn't mind arguing about religion. Some people even enjoy a good debate over religious philosophies. But there's one thing I have learned, and that's that the average lost person, whether a young person or adult, does not know what to do with a believer who, first of all, is so concerned about their lost condition, and secondly, so convinced of the truth of the Word of God that they weep when they witness. Maybe your wife here who has an unsaved husband and you've nagged at him the best you can to try to get him to Christ, but it isn't going to be nagging that's going to win his soul to Christ. You need to ask God to break your heart and give you tears. Maybe you've got an unsaved spouse or unsaved friend or, or an unsaved family member that doesn't know Christ and instead of debating with them and getting in the argument they always lure you into, you need to ask God to break your heart and give you tears. I can tell you story after story after story of people I've seen who came to Christ. I was in a meeting in, in the Eastern Shore of Maryland and on a, on a Wednesday night after the service was over, the pastor said, did you see the man that was sitting halfway back on the center aisle, had a wife and about an 11-year-old daughter next to him? I said, yes, sir. He said, that man's an atheist. He said, he's never been to church before tonight. He said, he came because his wife and daughter begged him to come because they could help, to get, help him get a chalk drawing. They wanted him because he'd hear the gospel. And he had been under conviction because he raised his hand in the invitation for prayer, but he didn't respond when the invitation was given. We prayed for that man the next day, the evening. He didn't come back. We prayed for him on Friday. Friday night, he came back again, sat on the same place on the aisle, wife next to him, 11-year-old daughter next to her, and he sat. I could tell he was under great conviction. He was slumped down in his seat, had an ugly look on his face like he had his own personal thunderstorm going on over his head. Got to the invitation time and I asked again, anybody that would like me to remember you in prayer because you don't know you're saved, and up went his hand again. But then I said what you may hear me say in the next two nights of our special meetings when we're emphasizing the gospel more. 
And I said, maybe you're a believer and you've got a family member, a friend or a neighbor with you tonight and you don't know whether or not they're safe. Don't make a big commotion about it, but why don't you just quietly lean over and ask him? Do you know for sure if you died, you go to heaven? If they say no, say, hey, come on, I'll go with you. Let's go talk to somebody. Sometimes all it takes is an encouraging word from someone to help someone get over their fear. I no sooner spoke those words, but the woman reached over and grabbed her, her, her husband's hand. And when they looked up at her, she asked him if he wouldn't come and get saved. He shook his head no. It broke her heart. She started to cry, big old tears that dripped off her chin onto the floor. She sobbing loudly, came past him out of the seat all the way to the aisle. She came, got on her knees, sobbing, praying, asking God to save her husband. 11-year-old daughter walked over, grabbed her daddy around the arm with both of her arms, looked up into his face, big old tears streaming down her. He didn't say a word to him, just grabbed him around his arm, looked up into his face. He looked down at her. I could tell it bothered him all the way from the platform where I was standing. Folks, she realized how much it bothered him. She let go of his arm, went back and stood where she'd been standing before, tears dripping off her chin onto the carpet. Folks, I don't think it's more than 30 seconds before that grown atheist, nobody thought would even come to church, never mind get saved, jumped out into the aisle, and I kid you not, ran to the pastor and asked him to show him how to get saved. And I was back in that church a few years later for more meetings, and that man, the pastor said, that man's been one of the most faithful men in our church ever since he got saved. What brought him to Christ? Well, it was the preaching of the gospel. That was necessary, but it was the tears and compassion of his family. Once quit fussing, debating, and ask God to break your heart and give you tears. Jesus said there's a great potential. The harvest is truly plenteous. There's a great problem. The laborers are few. There's a great prayer. Pray you, the Lord of the harvest. He'll send forth laborers into his harvest. And there's a great pattern. Jesus showed us we need a boldness to go, the Bible to plant, and a burden to weep for those who are lost. I'll close with this tonight. My father was finishing a service one night in a church that had a large platform and a massive pulpit. And when he was putting his notes away at the end of the service, he heard somebody call him, Mr. Webb! He looked around and didn't see anybody. So he went back to putting his notes away and he heard the voice again, Mr. Webb! He thought, well, man, maybe there's somebody down here in the front that I can't see because of this massive pulpit. So he got up on his tiptoes and he leaned over and looked down there and sure enough, there was a short, rich lady down there. He could tell she was rich because she had gold and diamond jewelry all over. She had a big fur coat on with an animal head on her shoulder, you know, that kind of thing. She had all of her hair plus somebody else's piled up on top of her head. She had a big old false eyelashes that flitted in the wind and so much purple over eyelids. She looked like a jack o' lantern with a candle gone out. My father said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? She said, Mr. Webb, I can't win my husband to the Lord just like that. Now understand my father was just a young man out of Bible college and before he realized it, he leaned over the pulpit, mimicked her tone of voice and said the following, well with that attitude you never will. She's already upset and offended and stomping her way up the aisle on, on her way out of the church. He dashed down off of the platform and ran up the aisle, grabbed the hold of her hand like a vice grip and said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm a young, foolish preacher. I shouldn't have said what I just said. Uh, she said, you've insulted me and I'm leaving. He said, no, ma'am, I won't let you go till you forgive me. She said, you're hurting my hand. He said, well, I won't let you go till you forgive me. She said, well, all right. As he spoke with her, she, he found out she not only had an unsaved husband, but two unsaved teenage boys, one a bit older than the other. He said, ma'am, what, what I should have told you is you hadn't won them because you're not going about it God's way. Your eyes are too dry. He'd ask God to break your heart. They prayed for her family. She went home that night, and my father said he wondered whether she'd ever come back again, but the next night she came back, sat in the same place, and part of the way through the sermon, she, he noticed she reached into her pocketbook and she pulled out a Kleenex or a tissue, depending on how ritzy you are. Rolled one corner of it up to a little bitty point and she dobbed in the corner of this eye. And she rolled up another corner and a point and she dobbed in the corner of that eye. My father said, well, praise God, God's going to do something yet. He said the next night she was back again in the same place and a whole truckload full of tissues wouldn't have done her any good. Right in the middle of the sermon, she got to crying right out loud. One eyelash came loose and went to half mast and all that makeup ran down her face in the streams, turning her white blouse to a color one. My father said, well, praise God, God's going to do something in that home yet. And I'll finish the story the way the woman told my father it happened. She said she went home that night, could not sleep. Got on her knees by her husband's bed, began to sob and pray and ask God to save her husband. He was awakened by the sobbing, rolled over, grumble, grumble, what's the racket about, woman? She said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to make you up. I'm just praying you'll get saved. I don't want you to die. Go to hell. Rumble, rumble, grumble. He rolled over and went back to sleep again. In the middle of the night, the two teenage boys woke up. My father says he thinks an angel pinched them. They were hungry. They got out of bed and started down the, the, the hall to the kitchen to get a snack, but they had to pass their parents' bedroom to get there, and as they came by their parents' room, the door was ajar, and they could hear their mother sobbing and saying something. 
and being nosy like some teenagers are, they crept and they listened by the door for a moment and they heard their mother call their names in prayer. No snack, they went back to bed. The next morning she was in the kitchen starting the oatmeal and suddenly uh, assaulting it with her tears, still weeping since the night before. When the two boys came downstairs to go out, she said, oh boys, tonight is family night at the revival meetings and I've been praying that you would go and that you'd get saved. And the older fellow ran out of the house and slammed the door so hard, 14 shingles might have come off the neighbor's roof. The younger one, however, spun around, hugged his mother and said, mama, mama, I'll go with you tonight. I'll go, I'll go. Later in the afternoon, she was vacuuming the rug in the living room and settling the dust with her tears, still weeping since the night before. When the front door of the house burst open and in ran that older teenage boy, boy who tackled her on the couch like a football fullback, hugged her up and said, Mama, we got up last night. We're going to get a snack and get something to eat. And we came by the room and we heard you crying and prayed. And Mama, I'll go tonight too. I'll go too. But you see, her husband had another job. He came, would come home from his day job and he would wolf his dinner down, rush upstairs, take a shower, dress in a business suit and sell insurance in the evenings. She could hardly even see him across the table because her eyes were so swollen with tears as he wolfed his meal down that night, excused himself to the table, run, ran up the stairs. They heard the water run in the shower, the hangers rattled in the closet and down he came wearing that same suit he always did to wear insurance and she began to cry even harder if it were possible. And she said, honey, listen, tonight is family night at the revival meetings and both of the boys said they're going to go out and pray it all day that you wouldn't go to work tonight and sell insurance. And before she could finish what she was even saying, she felt her husband's arms around her. And he hugged her and he said, honey, stop crying. I am not dressed up in a suit tonight to sell insurance. I'm going with you and the boys to church. My father said he saw that whole family walk into the back of that church auditorium that night. He didn't want to preach any sermons. He wanted to go skip that and go right to the invitation. Of course, he couldn't do that, so he preached the message, and when he got to the invitation that night and asked anybody that would like to be saved, would you step out and come? We'll have somebody take a Bible and show you how to be saved. First one into the aisle was that grown man, that husband, followed by one, then two teenage boys. And they linked their elbows together, and all three of them came marching down the aisle together to come to Christ with a leap and praising God, Mama, right behind them all. And that whole family was united in Christ. I do not know your heart. I do not know your family or your friends. But I do know what Jesus said about souls. The great potential, the harvest is truly plentiful. There are souls all over this area that would come to Christ. If you would just get to them with the message of the gospel, the, the problem, there's a great problem. The labors are few. Would you be willing to say, Lord, make me alert as I go about my business and my schooling and help me to be listening to your spirit, to be a witness. And maybe someone here will not only pray for the missionaries your church already supports, but will say, Lord, would you send forth more? And Lord, if you want to send me, show me, I'll go, I'll go. Maybe there's even somebody sitting here tonight with the, with the conviction of the spirit of God on your heart. He's been tugging at you tonight about, yeah, you can fill one of those open spots. Got a place for you. Jesus said there's a great prayer. Pray the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. Are you praying that God would use you? And then there's a great pattern. Are you following what Jesus showed us? We need to win souls. If tonight you need the boldness to go, come and ask him for it. If you need to ask him for an a, a understanding of the Bible to plan in hearts, ask him for that. And then start working on that. And if you need a burden, tears and compassion, not something fake and false and worked up, but genuine when it's necessary, you need to ask God to give you a burden. Take time to come tonight and ask for it because this is what the Savior had to say about souls. Let's bow together for the prayer tonight.